Hi, and welcome to The Corinne Barraclough Show, where every week I'll be telling the truth about the broken family law system, its impact on mental health, and I'll be lifting the lid on the damage of gender bias in mainstream media. I've had an incredible response to the pilot episode last week. Thank you so much for all your messages of support and also the flurry of real life stories that you've sent in. I want to start today by sharing a few messages from my mailbox. Taryn says, what a brilliant idea, have been following you for a while. We all have so many stories to share with you. And these next two are a little longer, so bear with me. These aren't unusual. I've received similar messages every week for the last few years since I started working in this space. Alan says, thank you for everything that you do, Corinne. I'm a silent follower. I still find it impossible to watch or listen to everything you do because I find it all so triggering. I never thought I would become a snowflake, but the trauma is always there, hidden in the background. Seeing the latest ads all over the place about domestic violence makes me feel sick. Thank you so much. We had a few messages back and forth, and he continued, I know I'm one of the lucky ones. I was the primary carer of my two very young children. My partner has a malignant cluster B personality disorder. She would threaten to kill the children or remove them from me forever if I didn't do what she said. When the youngest was out of nappy, she made her move and withheld the children from me. The court did not care about my stories of domestic violence. His story is heartbreaking. It's not unusual and it sums up perfectly why I wanted to do this show so much, to give you all a voice. And then we have Chris who says, I'm happy to have a chat whenever you want, Corinne. It's 13 years since I've seen or spoken to two of my kids. Their mother still has emotional blackmail control over them and my experience in the courts is pretty shocking. I know you get heaps of messages, but I'm just one of thousands of people watching your page in a positive way. Chris, I'll be in touch with you this week. Please keep your stories, leads, information and feedback coming. My interview today is with a really impressive, courageous psychologist from London who's working hard to shine a light on the gender bias within her own sector. Deborah Powney, a PhD psychology candidate in the UK, focusing on recovery and adaption, male and female victims of intimate partner violence. Essentially, she researches recovery from DV regardless of gender. So I'm very excited about speaking to Deborah Powney, who's a um, really, really strong and courageous psychologist based in London. So we're going to head over to the UK and catch up with her now. Hi, Karen. Hi, how are you doing, Debs? I'm doing well, yeah. How are you? Very good, thank you. Excellent. <laughs> we get stuck straight in. Okay. So much that I want to talk to you about. So let's start with your online survey, which was okay. an online survey looking specifically into men, but there were also women featured in the survey too. How did it go? What were you researching and why were you looking into that? Okay, uh, it went phenomenally well. I'm currently sat on the world's largest data set of its type. Wow. Um, it, it, uh, it, it blew me away how successful it was. Um, the reason I wanted to do it, it, ca it came about absolutely because of um, COVID, um, because I had another study, study ready to go live, um, yeah. which was looking at uh, recovery of male victims using um, peer mentoring and um, walking in the outdoors, where I, I live in the middle of nowhere. And um, I'm very thankful for the, the health benefits of, of where I live. Um, but literally with a week to go to launch, uh, we went into lockdown. Yeah. So uh, I furiously scribbled a, um, a wish list survey, I think it'd be best described, for what I would want uh, an initial foundation survey to cover for male victims. The reason being that there's an absolute uh, millions of uh, research that looks at female victims of domestic abuse, um, but very, very few, um, and I've read all of them, <laughs> that's how few there are, uh, deals with um, male victims. And as I study male and female victims as part of my PhD, um, I'd identified a gap and wanted to know more. So uh, the survey actually included um, a huge amount, uh, including four psychological scales that take victims from 
when the abuse first manifested right through to how they've adapted now. But also a lot of um, myth-busting questions were in there. Um, so, for example, um, the feminist model tends to, even, even if they acknowledge that men can be victims, tends to say things like, men don't get injured, men don't feel fear, and men can leave whenever they want. Um, so being a, a northern English last, uh, at last, we call a spade a shovel. <laughs> and uh, I asked those very questions. Um, are you or were you afraid of your partner? Um, yeah. Why didn't you leave if, if you were still in the um, abusive relationship? And um, were you hurt or injured? And overwhelmingly, uh, got the exact opposite of what had been presented by the feminist model. What is the prize? Um, yes. <laughs> well, for example, one of the myths they put out there is that men don't reach out, so they don't yep. ask for um, help. And 86% um, of the men that did my completed my survey, of which there was almost 1,400, um, yep. had reached out for help. So and did they it's uh, no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, 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 I mean, to be honest, it depends where they've reached, reached out for. And even then it was um, a bit hit and miss. But where the, you can imagine that they didn't reach out to domestic abuse services because there aren't any for them. Yeah. Um, the official line tended to be GPs um, or homeless services if they were homeless um, or solicitors. Um, yeah. But it tended to be less formal, so more about friends and family um, and, and, and that kind of stuff. And even then, there was a, a real mix of whether they were believed or not. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Tell me what your issue is with the gendered narrative around violence and tell me what does the data actually say? OK, well, um, the I, I have huge issues with the gender model but to put it in a nutshell yeah. it doesn't help anybody it actually harms everybody including the women that it professes to protect and the reason for that is very simple is that the gender model has a central premise for domestic abuse and it says that domestic abuse is committed by men against women because they are women mm -hmm. now that sounds um very simplistic and it is very simplistic and untrue it prevents the real issues behind domestic abuse ever being discovered because they put it down to the mythical patriarchy mm -hmm. um but also it makes women victims uh by accident of birth if you're told that you're being victimized because you're a woman how, how do you overcome that how do you overturn yeah. that how do you adapt to that? It's, yeah. It hurts everybody. It ignores male victims completely. It ignore, and, and by default, therefore, ignores female perpetrators, which means there's a lot of women out there, and I'm talking hundreds of thousands or millions of women out there that are not getting support of perpetrator programmes, and therefore they're being left to live a life of violence. Yeah. Now... All that harm on those adults, be it male, female, victim or perpetrator, has a central effect on children. Because if the male victims are being ignored, the female victims are not being properly treated, the female perpetrators are being ignored and the male victims are not being properly treated, then who, out, who loses out in all of those cases? Yeah, the children. children. Yeah. And and don't why there's such a huge taboo around female violence still in society, isn't there? And yeah. abuse of guns. You know, there's plenty of data talking about um, children are, are are incredibly unsafe with their mothers, and um, you know, mm. abuse of guns is a is a genuine, real issue across the globe. And yet, the feminist narrative squashes that down. And as you say, ultimately, that's meaning that abusive mothers themselves aren't getting the help they need. Mm. Um, the children are subject to all shades of hell, um, yeah. and nobody wins from nobody wins from this narrative. This is what makes no me makes me insane. <laughs> uh, absolutely, I mean, it, for me, that the fact that they profess to be protecting women, yeah, yet 
women are ignored as perpetrators and not getting help and told yeah. as a victim that the reason you're a victim is you're a woman. I can't tell you how harmful that is. Yes. Now, look, you, both you and I have both copped pretty fierce backlash from the Ooh, feminist, yes. <laughs> feminist pack. And we won't name specific names, but, you know, both you and I know who we're talking about. Um, yeah. But they, they like to own the narrative around domestic violence, and there's a lot of money at stake. But tell me, why do you think they're so afraid of the truth? Is it money? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's a, a multitude of sins, shall we say. And um, I, I, I use sins in, in, as a sort of half tongue in cheek issue here because you can compare the ideology that surrounds the issue of domestic abuse with feminism directly to not religion as a whole, but a maladaptive religion or cult, if you want to put it in, in that way. And, mm -hmm. and if you think about cults, and I am studying them as, as part of my thesis, um, you can, they have a hierarchy where those at the bottom of that hierarchy will actually think they are doing good. So in yeah. this particular instance, in, in the UK certainly, a lot of the predominant women's groups have an, a, a legion of volunteers at, at the front line that are really in it just to really help women yeah. and children. There is, there is no doubt about it. Yeah. A absolutely. But in the, in the same organisation that is pontificating about needing this volunteer ar army, you've got a CEO that has a baseline salary that's more than our prime minister. Yeah. It, and so th how, how do those two things compare? And yeah. I, I suppose you, you can compare it to cult leaders that are sending out their minions to do the, the, the work and beg and get money and yeah. slave labor and all the rest of it meanwhile they're swanning around in, yeah, yeah. They're, they're doing all that meanwhile they're swanning around in a fleet of rolls royces and yeah. not not to say that the, the the ceos of these organizations have a fleet of c of, of rolls royces but they certainly have very nice houses and privately educated children and um, they're making a really good living out of speaking about this ideology and yeah. and because they are targeting vulnerable women who need need to find some meaning in in what's happened to them yeah and, and i speak as a woman from experience in knowing that situation then of course they're going to latch on to something like that they're going to feel part of a sisterhood they're going to yeah. feel part of a group of belonging and then along comes you and i and says oh actually all that yes not what it seems <laughs> And, and then people donate and people donate as you say like with the, the frontline volunteers people donate with good intentions trying to help they're trying to help a genuine problem here but all of the money goes on marketing advertising and propaganda and it's all to keep that yeah. uh, that narrative of fear alive and thriving because that guarantees the next round of funding which keeps the whole machine ticking along again and it actually doesn't doesn't even begin to fix the real issues it doesn't look at any societal problems we're blaming an imaginary en enemy rather than beginning to tackle all of the societal contributing factors which you and i could talk about forever so Dr. John Barry and Martin Seeger set up the male psychology section of the British Psychological Society. How many votes went against the formation of setting that up specifically for men? Can you tell mm -hmm. me? Well, um, uh, 2,100 people voted for this section and 1,300 people voted against this section. Um, mm -hmm. So it was a, like a two to one ratio of those that had voted for the section and against. Um, but it seemed to be that there was a campaign um, ag against the section um, from, and, and you're not going to believe me when I say this, the critical psychologists. <laughs> and we know what the cr critical theory is, is Erica at the moment. Um, yeah. So there's, uh, there's some great issues there. But they um, essentially started a, a propaganda campaign that said, and, and 
again when i say this you won't believe me that we in the in the, the male psychology section we we look at issues that predominantly affect men so suicide homelessness um boys failing school all those kind of issues and yeah. um literally the 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 people that criticized the section were saying but they don't affect men because they are men they affect that they that's because it's a various other reasons and and i'm literally sat there reading it thinking but you say that all the time about women's issues and yes something overwhelmingly affects men like suicide homelessness yeah. Yeah. all these uh, deaths in the workplace all these huge issues and all of a sudden it's not about gender <laughs> What does this mean for men who need help? Well, if if I if I look at it from a male perspective, um, I, I, where would you go if if you yeah. if you think the majority of people that you meet in in support services tends to be women? Yeah. So if if you're constantly bombarded with with a propaganda that says. Uh, all all men uh, are rubbish. All all men should be kept, you know top masculinity. Why would you even go to talk to what is essentially an army of middle aged women? Yes, exactly. So yeah. they're not reaching out. They're not seeking services, and and I I. I and quite honestly, I would know where to signpost them. Well, there is no way. There is no way. So I, you know, same thing on my page. I get messages from men themselves, from their sisters, from their mothers, from grandparents. Everybody absolutely desperate to help people. We all know that the male suicide rate is soaring. There is nowhere to turn. And you know, I have a friend here in Australia who called the suicide callback line eight years ago. He's still waiting for a call back. What is this doing to, you know, does that surprise yeah. you? What, what's it doing to the state of men's health? Um, it's it's driving men's health into the an early grave. You know, the, mm. these these men, where, where do they go? Because from boyhood, you're told that don't be a dysfunctional woman, be a better uh, ally you know you are don't suffer from toxic masculinity i don't hear any anything positive for men yeah you know i'm i see myself as a very strong independent woman but i want to be protected i i enjoy men and masculinity uh i never feel like i'm unequal i i feel that there are differences and similarities and only way that we're going to tackle any issue is how to do this together yeah yeah both you and i are strong women and that's why the feminist pack hate us <laughs> but let me ask you yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you think that ideology should be allowed in health industries in healthcare? Uh, in, a, in a nutshell no um, there's, you can have a personal ideology, but it should not be allowed in healthcare. We, uh, I, I know we're hearing a lot of things at the moment about lived experiences and, um, expert by experience and all the critical theory, decolonization and power our structures and stuff but the truth of the matter is we have to be objective we can only find the truth by using robust scientific methods yes we should absolutely listen to the lived experience and learn from it but that lived experience when it's singular is anecdotal the only time it becomes data is when we listen to a lot of people and we do that in a robust objective scientific method yeah brilliantly well said how do we fix all this mess Deb? like what do we do next what's our next move well i, I um I, i'm i'm not blowing smoke here but 
I think things like this, you read out into the public domain. One, one of the things I say often about my research is that I don't own this research. I'm a kicker. And yeah. men have trusted me to give me their data. And now it's my job to analyse it and use it and get yeah. it out there and get it told and plug that gap. So every time I hear the gender model telling me that men don't feel fear, I can stand mm -hmm. up and go, uh, I've got some data here to disprove that. Um, yes. And that's what we need to do. We need to do this we, and we need to pass that ownership of data out of the ivory of and give it back to people we take it from. And yes. I would love the men and the families that love them that give me this data to be able to take my analysis and challenge politicians. You know, when, when politicians are asking for their vote, ask them, what are you doing about male side? What are your views on domestic yeah. use? Funding should go. You know, these are taxpayers' money, taxpayers that are funding a maladaptive religion. You know, this, this needs to stop. But we need to get this data analysed robustly and given back to the public. And we've got to be brave and we've got to be courageous and we've got to stand in this fight together because it's a one hell of a fight we're up against, isn't it? Thank you so much for coming Absolutely. on. I'll get you back soon. Look forward to chatting to you as always. That was Deborah Powney, a name that you'll be hearing often on this show and I'm sure for years to come. Now, I want to say a few things about the response to these newspaper front pages. Last week, police slapped new charges on the two selfish women behind the Queensland COVID-19 cluster, describing their actions as, quote, criminal. Their actions were criminal. It's reported these two women are facing up to five years in prison. Most Australians agree this behaviour is unacceptable. Mainstream Australians have no interest in defending these two clowns. And yet there are some loudmouth activists who appear to believe that women should never be questioned. The real idiots are not ordinary people not following the rules, this raging pack of activists said. Give it an effing rest attacking them. Hmm. Well, no, actually. Toxic human beings who choose to endanger other human beings should be called out, and they should be called out loudly. They're putting other people's lives at risk. Women are not a protected species. Women need to be held equally accountable. The sane among us don't intend to defend idiots, whichever gender they happen to be. Talking of women behaving badly, a young policewoman who was enforcing coronavirus restrictions in Melbourne's southeast allegedly had her head repeatedly smashed into concrete paving during a confrontation with a woman refusing to wear a mask. The policewoman is 26 years old. She approached the 38-year-old woman with another officer who was on duty with her. During the scuffle, the 38-year-old woman smashed the head of the policewoman several times into a concrete area on the ground. Some of her hair was ripped out and she was left concussed. Please take a minute to imagine the outrage if this was a man who had smashed this young police officer's head. Please take a minute to imagine the usual suspects who would be wheeled out to screech about toxic masculinity in action. Their gendered narrative is flawed and one look at the news confirms that. As a side note, this is also where we end up when left-wing activists push against law and order and spread disrespect for our police with talk about defunding them. This nonsense has consequences, which in this case included concussion. Left-wing activists also love to preach that revenge porn is a gendered issue. It's evil, toxic men who seek power and control over women, they say. Rubbish. The new details have emerged in Cotoni Stagg's revenge porn scandal, which shined the truth on the flawed gendered narrative. The Brisbane Broncos Centre has met with lawyers after a sex video was released without his consent. He's 21. Once again, can you imagine the outrage if this was a female player caught up in a revenge porn scandal? Imagine the man blaming that would be going on. Revenge porn is not a gendered issue. It's not about toxic masculinity and it's not about inequality. Sometimes boys behave badly, sometimes girls behave badly. And I believe acknowledging that is called equality. 
Finally, I want to respond to a particularly gross man-hating quote that's been doing the rounds on social media. Time after time, week after week, I hear the same predictable voices trying to pretend that modern feminism is not anti-men. And then you get fools like feminist writer Salma L. Wardney saying, I sit and think about women and I think about our oppression and I think about everything we've suffered and I think about everything my five girlfriends around me have suffered. And the question shouldn't be, why do you hate men? The question should be, how can you stop hating men? Why don't men come up to me and go, oh my God, what can we do so that you don't hate us? because you are so within your rights to hate us after everything we have done and all the women all around you. What? What is this crap? We all need to start calling out these muppets who think it's cool to man-hate. We all need to start pushing back on claims that modern feminism has anything to do with equality. This is not equality. Equality is not revenge. This is pure and open misandry. This is extremists moving discourse ever left. This is the anti-male rhetoric that's dripping from our mainstream media, unchallenged. Modern feminism is about demonising men for money and power. It's time to call it out. We're over it. Right, that's enough Barraclough for now. See you next week. Stay tuned. We've got plenty more goodies coming up on goodsource.news. We've got James McPherson. That show will be out tomorrow morning. And then we've also got Pello Talk Live, which will be... Tuesday evening. If you're sick and tired of ABC rubbish, that's a definite must um, must see for you. For you there. Look forward to seeing you then. The Corin Barraclough Show is a production of The Good Source, hosted by Corin Barraclough. To watch, listen to, or read more new media without the social justice warrior narratives or politically correct fact filter, visit GoodSource.news. That's good S A U C E dot news. Become a Good Source supporter for exclusive access to live and unedited interview recordings, including the conversations before and after the show. 